Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. Now, this is the silver chart in the Great British Pound uh, weekly. And you can see here, let's put the volume up. You can see that uh, we had a pretty big volume spike. But the main takeaway from this is that there's no question now that the silver price in British pound is in a uh, bull market. It has been since 2003, roughly, and it continues. So no matter how you draw the lines in, you can see here, you can draw them from the very bottom, about three British pound or so, and we're now at 13, so a 400% increase, roughly, and you can see that's pretty much a solid bull trend. Uh, let's throw up the MACD and take a look at it. Now we've covered this with, with the precious metals as this sort of rolling currency war goes around the world. And now with this Brexit vote, with Britain voting to leave the EU, and what seems to be the apparent demise of the EU, I think that was probably signaled with the universal invasion of Islamic and I would have I would have to term it an Islamic army because um, I don't know what the statistics are but it's a, the vast majority of the Islamic immigrants coming into Europe are young men it's an army uh, I don't think there's any disagreement about that in alternative circles. It's uh, it's a planned thing, and this was a planned thing. I'm going to show you here the one of the um, numerological numerological symbologies that we have with this vote and when it came, and with simultaneous crashes in the markets around the world. The U.S. market didn't take too much of a hit. We're going to look at that next, but I just want to point out to you that. We not only have bounced off roughly the 2008 support in the in the British pound, but we're resuming an uptrend. And you can see that there isn't much left of resistance. There's some in here up to about 16. So over to the U.S. silver chart, that's not nearly as bullish because the dollar is not weakening. So we haven't even really surpassed the 2008 highs. Uh, if you hold US dollars and that's your primary savings then you still have a window to stack silver and it it's still incredibly cheap the dollar is going to go it's just a matter of time now let's jump over to crude oil just to review what's happening in some of these markets so crude oil had a big bounce but now you can see it's it's starting to roll over it's crossed over the MACD but it, it's definitely rolling over I want to go and pull up the Dow Transportation Index. Now, we did not have nearly as big of a move down in our stocks as the European stocks did. But I pointed out before this pattern here in the transports, clearly a top, clearly we're moving down. And we're talking about, you know, 9,000, uh, almost 9,300 there down to about 7,300. So that's a 2,000 point move in stocks going down. So a definite downtrend. Now, the big chart of the day, if you go over to uh, FinViz Futures, is the VIX. This is the long-term view of the VIX. And uh, it's, uh, it's not extreme on this chart because we're just revisiting uh, some of the past ones but if we go back and pull it to the daily you can see how big today's move was in the VIX so you can see that the spike went to all the way up to 28 and we'll put it back on the the furthest chart and zoom that in so that you can see 28 puts us nearly up here and the point that I would like to draw as a parallel would be this area in here. Do you see where we were beginning the financial crisis? Do you see how we got those uh, 
three or four spikes and then we got the blast off that was the crash of the stock market you can see the same thing here uh, we've got three or four spikes up they're in a falling pattern and then will we get the next one so interesting chart now related to that is going to be this bizarre uh, numer numerological uh, thing here where someone this is from Godlike Productions where someone actually went to the last crash I think this was the Shemitah date and again I don't I don't put a lot of importance uh, significance to that but you can see here that that date was September 29th 2008 that was the big crash and you can see that was exactly seven years seven months seven weeks and seven days before today, which was a crash. Uh, not a crash in the US, but let's pull up, say, Euro stocks. Uh, we'll do Euro next. So that, that doesn't really show it. Let's try the, um, the FTSE. Oh, it's under UK. So this is the FTSE, but as far as percentage moves, and that, that really isn't that big as well. Definitely topping, but as far as percentage moves, we had the biggest moves coming out of Europe and other places in the world, but the US had some big drops. Now, what is the significance of this? Uh, what does it mean? Well, I have to say, I, I, I don't believe it's a coincidence. I think it's all planned, and I think it's just a further admission or recognition by the powers that be that this EU experiment is going to end as a failure. And I'm going to discuss further when we get into Bible prophecy about what it's about, what they thought it was going to be about, and what it, what it's really about. So before we do that, let's go over to the Bitcoin chart. And this is off of Bitstamp. So if you remember, I predicted that uh, we were going to get a correction. We corrected out of this pennant here, and we had a failure, and then another failure, and then we started to get the big drop. And when we got that, I said, we were either going to test the baseline pennant, which was this area, or we're going to test, in an extreme situation, this or this area. So you can see we really only tested that first area. We got down to a low on uh, of about 543. You can see we bounced up to about 676. And that was from around 778. So we've already recovered about 50% of the move. Taking it out to the long-term chart, you can see that. So do I believe that the $1,200 price on Bitcoin is uh, going to be tested? Yes, I believe this price here, 1163 that's Bitstamp or Bitfinex. I don't think it goes out that far. 1175 on Bitfinex. Yes, I think that price will fall. Um, Maybe not this year, probably at least then next year. So we've got a bounce. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if it rolls over and continues down. It looks very, very strong from here. You can see how much strength is coming into it. And let's jump over to the Chinese market. Um, quite a bit of strength there as well. So it's made up a significant percentage of how much it dropped. So let's get over to some of these Brexit articles, what this mean, what this vote means, what happened, and uh, what I think it, it means going forward. So we'll start with the uh, latest news here, and this is from Express UK. End of the EU. Germany warns five more countries could leave Europe after Brexit. France, the Netherlands, Austria, Finland, and Hungary could leave. Front National Leader Marie Le Pen, Marine Le Pen has pledged to hold a French referendum if she emerges victorious in next year's presidential elections. Well, for the past two months, a next that has been on the cards after Dutch voters overwhelmingly rejected a Ukraine-European Union treaty. Details of Berlin's concerns were outlined in a finance ministry strategy document. 
Angela Merkel's country faces having to pay an extra $2.44 billion a year to the annual EU budget once Britain has left. Fears for the future of the EU have prompted German government officials to propose that Britain is offered constructive exit negotiations, the aim of making the UK an associated partner country of the EU, according to German newspaper Die Welt today. So there's the very unhappy face of Angela Merkel. And uh, these people are a bunch of lunatics, honestly. And they don't know the future. They only know what their masters tell them. And their masters don't know the future. So let's read one more article here on this Brexit. And then I'm going to try to summarize this from a biblical point of view. And this is... uh, on Zero Hedge, this is Brexit. Individualism is greater than nationalism, which is greater than globalism. From Jeff Diaz to the Mises Institute. Decentralization and devolution of state power is always a good thing, regardless of the motivations behind such movements. Hunter S. Thompson, looking back on the 60s counterculture in San Francisco, lamented the end of that era and its imagined flower child innocence. Quote, so now, less than five years later, you can go up on a steep hill in Las Vegas and look west, and with the right kind of eyes, you can almost see the high water mark, that place where the wave, the wave finally broke and rolled back. Does today's Brexit vote similarly mark the spot where the once inevitable march of globalism begins to recede? Have ordinary people around the world reached the point where real questions about self-determination have become too acute to ignore any longer. Globalism, championed almost exclusively by political and economic elites, has been the dominant force in the West for a hundred years. World War I and the League of Nations established a framework for multinational military excursions while the creation of the Federal Reserve Bank set the stage for the eventual emergence of the U.S. dollar as a worldwide reserve currency. Progressive government programs in Western countries promised new model a new model for universalism and peace in the aftermath of destruction of Europe. Human rights, democracy, and enlightened social views were now to serve as hallmarks of the post-monarchial Europe and rising U.S. But globalism was never liberalism, nor was it intended to be by its architects. At its As its core, globalism has always meant rule by illiberal elites under the guise of mass democracy. It has always been distantly anti-democratic and anti-freedom, even as it purported to represent liberation from repressive governments and poverty. Globalism is not, as its supporters claim, simply the inevitable outcome of modern technology applied to communication, trade, and travel. It is not the world getting smaller. It is, in fact, an ideology and worldview that must be imposed by statist and cronyist means. It is the civic religion of people named Clinton, Bush, Blair, Cameron, and Lagarde. Yes, libertarians advocate unfettered global trade. Even marginally free trade has unquestionably created enormous wealth and prosperity for millions around the world. Trade, specialization, and understanding of comparative advantage have done more to relieve poverty than a million United Nations or international monetary funds. But the EU, GATT, the WTO, NAFTA, TPP, and the whole alphabet soup of trade schemes are wholly illiberal impediments masquerading as real commercial freedom. In fact, true free trade occurs only in the absence of government agreements. The only legislation required is a unilateral one-sentence bill. Country X is hereby eliminates all import duties, taxes, and tariffs on all Y goods imported from country Z. As Godfrey Bloom explains, the European Union is primarily a customs zone, not a free trade zone. A bureaucracy in Brussels is hardly necessary to enact simple pan-European tariff reductions. It is necessary, however, to begin building what globalism truly demands, a de facto European government complete with dense regulatory and tax rules, quasi-judicial bodies, a nascent military, and further subordination of national, linguistic, and cultural identities. Which brings us to the Brexit vote, which offers Britons far more than simply an opportunity to remove themselves from a doomed EU political and monetary project. It is an opportunity to forestall the juggernaut, at least for a period, 
and reflect on the current path. It is a chance to fire a shot heard around the world to challenge the wisdom of the globalism is inevitable narrative. It is the UK's last chance to ask in a time when even asking is an act of rebellion, the most important political question of our day, who decides? Ludwig, Ludwig Mogmises understood that self-determination is the fundamental goal of liberty or real liberalism. It's true that libertarians ought not to concern themselves with national sovereignty in the political sense because governments are not sovereign kings and should not be treated as worthy of determining the course of our lives. But it's also true that the more attenuated the link between an individual and the body purporting to govern him, the less control, self-determination, self-determination that the individual has. To quote Mises from his 1927 classic in German, Liberalismus, if it were in any way possible to grant this right of self-determination to every individual person, it would have to be done. Ultimately, Brexit is not a referendum on trade, immigration, or the technical rules promulgated by the awful European Parliament. It is a referendum on nationhood which is a step away from globalism and closer to individual self-determination. Libertarians should view the decentralization and devolution of state power as ever and always a good thing, regardless of the motivations behind such movements, reducing the size and scope of any single or multinational state's dominion is decidedly healthy for liberty. So there's the von Mises school take on this. I have to say I don't 100% agree with this, but I agree with it 99%. I think I would have some qualms about some of the free trade, just because there's so much fraud in that. But uh, that's that's the take on this thing. Now, what is the biblical take? Now, I've covered this before about Daniel 7 and the importance of Daniel 7 for this issue. But I'm going to start off by taking you to the um, Wikipedia entry to the book by Hal Lindsey. This is probably the most popular Christian book, I think, that has ever sold. Hal Lindsey is also my father in the Lord, so I became a Christian as a result of reading one of his books. Actually, it was uh, the book uh, that came after this, Satan is Alive and Well on Planet Earth. But uh, this is a very influential book. It came out in the 70s, and basically what it did was it made Bible prophecy understandable for the common man. And uh, it introduced Bible prophecy to the world. Uh, now, there's a lot of qualms I have with Hal Lindsey. He used the American Standard Version, which is a corrupt version of the Bible. Uh, and I'm gonna, But I'm going to get to the main point of this is the... Uh, treatment of the EU. Now, admittedly, it is a literalist, that's very important, premillennial, also important, and dispensational eschatology. I definitely consider myself all of those, literalist, premillennial, and dispensational. So, where does this break down and how does this fit into this Brexit? Well, let's look at the reference here to the EU and what that has to do with what's going on today. So he cited this. He, it says he cited an increase in the frequency of famines, wars, and earthquakes as key events leading up to the end of the world. He also foretold a Soviet invasion of Israel, War of Gog and Magog. Lindsay also predicted that the European Economic Community, which preceded the European Union, was destined according to biblical prophecy, to become a United States of Europe, which in turn, he says, is destined to become a revived Roman Empire ruled by the Antichrist. So this is the most important one in regards to the topic that we're on here. Now, not only do I believe that Hal Lindsey believed this, but I also believe that most of the elites who, uh, for want of a better word, I'll call them Satanists, uh, whatever they are, Luciferians or whatever. But I actually believe that they believe this as well. And 
I believe that it's not going to be the case. Now, let me show you why that's really important with this Brexit vote and this most important passage I've covered before in Daniel 7. Now, Daniel 7 is normally interpreted by most, the vast majority of biblical scholars, as to just be a mirror image of Daniel 2. If you remember Daniel 2, Daniel 2 is about the statue. King Nebuchadnezzar is given a vision of the kings that come after him because if you remember what he was pondering on his bed as he was king of the entire world at that time it was all the dominion was given to him of, of the entire world he wondered what would come after and in Daniel 2 he was given the answer it was this statue and if you remember the story he couldn't remember the dream or he said he couldn't remember the dream and he he ordered that all the wise men be destroyed until Daniel came forth and not only told him the dream, but told him the interpretation of the dream which God had revealed to him. And it showed these successive kingdoms that would exist after him. And the kingdoms were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. So most Bible scholars believe that Daniel 7 is a mirror image of that, but it's seen from the the explanation they use is the statue is looking at it from man's perspective and it goes ahead of gold and then silver and then brass and then iron and iron and miry clay as it uh, goes down in strength and, and that's supposedly going to be man's view and then these four kingdoms are viewed in Daniel 7 from God's perspective as these horrible powerful beasts. Now, I don't believe that. I actually believe that Daniel 7 is a prophecy about the same sort of thing happening after Christ. Daniel 2 is about the kingdoms that would arise before Christ's advent. And Daniel 7 is about the kingdoms that would arise after Christ's advent. And we have four again. Now, the one that is the same is this iron kingdom, the Roman Empire. And so that's the big issue about this revived Roman Empire. Now let's read this prophecy given to Daniel. There were four, starting in verse 3, And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Now I'm going to tell you that this is Britain and America. The lion is the symbol of Great Britain. The eagle's wings is clearly the symbol of America. Flight came here. I could go into a long explanation of why this is Britain and America. The next beast is, and it says, very importantly, I beheld until the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from earth and made to stand upon the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. What's the imp interpretation of that? Perhaps dictatorship. I can't tell you for sure. And then the second one, I behold another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised itself up on one side. It had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it, and they said thus unto it, Arise and devour much flesh. Now, if you ask anyone in the world what country is the bear, they would tell you it's the Soviet Union. Now, the next beast is a leopard, which had on the back of it four wings of a fowl, and the beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Now, I've argued many times and tried to show that this leopard, which is the leopard's native land is in Asia. It is yellow with black spots. There's a lot of explanations I can go into to explain this to you, that this, I believe, is China or a Asian empire, China and the rest of Asia rising up. That is the third, uh, in, in order, the one that is going to be dominant in the post-Christ uh, post period, in other words, the AD period of prophecy. And, of course, the last one is, again, very similar to the fourth one in Daniel 2. A fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, strong and, ex and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth that devoured and break in pieces, stamped the residue with its feet. So this one actually consumed the whole earth. You can see uh, down here, I would know the truth of the fourth beast which was diverse from all the others, exceedingly dreadful, whose teeth were iron, its nails were brass, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with its feet. And it made war with the saints. And it, uh, it says, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be like the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole 
earth and tread it down and break it into pieces. So the big question is, is the European Union the revived Roman Empire? And my answer is, no, it's not. And this Brexit vote for me is a clear indication that Britain never was a part of it. It was never intended to be a part of it. Britain is the lion. It is not the fourth beast. It is not a part of that. And the EU was an attempt by the elites of the world to make this thing happen. But I don't believe it's going to happen. I certainly would not. Now let me give you a caveat here for the people who are post-tribulation or mid-tribulation. For me, that is a completely, absolutely untenable hypothesis that there could be anything between Christ's imminent return. In other words, that Christ can return at any moment. If you take away that expectation, for me, that is uh, an unbiblical doctrine. As Christians, we are to expect the any moment return of Christ, and that would be the rapture. Now, if there's any kind of post-trib or mid-trib or anything else, then obviously we're not looking for the immediate return of Christ. We're looking for something else and then him returning. That can't be in my mind. So, this idea that the EU is this fourth beast, I'm going to give you something that may indicate that it's going to be further in the future than one might think. And that's going to be that the leopard that has to arise before the first fourth beast arises, which is going to be Asia, uh, that's, that has to happen first. Now, it doesn't have to happen in the sense that uh, it couldn't begin to happen right now, which it already is, and Christ could come and it could continue. Uh, and, and there's some other verses I could go very much in depth into this, saying that he continues for a space and a time, and that the kingdom that now is. So it's very possible that the beginning of China's rise could happen, uh, and then the rapture could occur and it could continue to rise. So by no means am I saying that the rise of China uh, has to happen before the rapture. But... This is the next kingdom we expect to arise, is this leopard. And we haven't seen this yet, a full exertion of power. The most important exertion of power that we're looking for is the patrolling of the waters of the Middle East because all of these prophecies are given in relation to Israel. You have to remember that God is revealing things in relation to Israel. Uh, God is not, he is not, indebted to Gentile nations to tell them what their future history is. Uh, he, he doesn't owe anyone anything. He had called Abraham and made promises and covenants with Abraham and his line. Prophecy is related to Israel in every instance. So China is only in prophecy to the extent that it is related to Israel, as well as Russia, Great Britain, Medo-Persia, Babylon, every other kingdom that's existed on the earth is only in prophecy to the extent that it relates to Israel. So my point is this leopard is in the process of arising. We are not in the stage where this fourth beast, this dreadful and terrible beast, which many people, including my father and the Lord, Hal Lindsey, thought would be the EU. With this Brexit, for me, it becomes very clear Britain is not a part of the EU or of this fourth beast. It's not time for this fourth beast to arise, but it's sometime in the future, and we'll talk to you next time.